Um, do you know Carlos Anacondia? Yeah, heard the name. Uh, I probably mentioned him a few times before. Carlos Anacondia is an Argentinian. And in Argentina, he, I think he became a Christian about at the age of 29. He was a businessman um, owning a nuts and bolt factory. And he became a Christian. And then he started preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And he was a little bit unusual. First of all, he was very effective. He wasn't a properly ordained pastor, but like in, in Argentina now, the Christians define the time before and after Carlos Anacondia. That's how impacting he was. When he started doing ministry, the, the numbers of people that committed their lives to Jesus were astounding. And first of all, they didn't quite want to believe it. You know, the first city he went to, 40,000 people said yes to Jesus. The second city he went to, it was 90,000 90, people committed their lives to Jesus. You know, and then uh, I like this one, uh, a, a town called San Justo, which has the population of Toowoomba. He would go there, he would preach for three months. If you can picture it, Carlos Anacondia preaching in Toowoomba in Queen's Park for three months every night. And at the end of it, 70,000 people publicly give their heart to Jesus. So that's a little bit astounding. So um, I think according to one book, two million people came to Jesus in the last 30 years in his ministry. So impacting, but he actually got known by a particular catchphrase that he would use all the time in all of his campaigns, in city after city. And this particular catchphrase also formed the title of a book that he wrote, and that's how I got to know him. And the catchphrase is, Listen to me, Satan. So he would preach about Jesus, the salvation that is on offer because of him, because he died for us. And then, you know, he would give an opportunity for people to give their hearts to Jesus, to belong to Jesus. And then he would say, listen to me, Satan. I, I come against you in the name of Jesus Christ. And in, in Jesus' name and by the authority that he's given me, I pray gold spells. I come against white witches and black witches and white witchcraft. I, I come against you, Satan, spirit of death. I come against... He would go on like this for 15, 20 minutes. And there would be thousands in front of him. You know, these days a whole stadium, 60,000 people, and he would just be one man on the stage says, listen to me, Satan, I come against you now. And you know, he goes on for 15, 20 minutes, and then there would be a response, and people would start flip-flopping. They would be, you know, the, the unclean spirits that have attached themselves to people would get a little bit agitated by the direct confrontation with the name of Jesus, and they would stir up and then people would manifest, which they do once these spirits get challenged and come to the surface. And, you know, they would twitch, eyes would roll and, you know, snarling. All the, all the things you know on TV can happen. So I thought I, I'd show you a little clip and show you what it's like. So... That's him. Espíritu de muerte, de suicidio. Suelta las vidas ahora. Rompe las cadenas ahora. En el nombre de Jesús de Nazaret. En el nombre de Jesús de Nazaret. En el nombre de Jesús de Nazaret. Satanás. Satanás. Retrocede, diablo. Retrocede, diablo. Fuera. En el nombre de Jesús. 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 Okay, very short clip. Gives you a little bit of a, a glimpse. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? You, you put, if, if you're really comfortable, it means you've been in this church for a while. <laughs> I have not grown up with this. When I was growing up in the church in the West, I was told Satan doesn't really exist. And, and you know, all of that in the Bible is a bit of a primitive worldview. And then I've grown up in a church where you don't talk about it. You know it's maybe there, but you don't talk about it. 
And you especially don't talk about it if you want to evangelize and reach people that have never heard about Jesus or anything. Because it may be a little bit uncivilized or something. But Carlos in the Condia, he, he doesn't seem to have a problem. That's an outreach evangelism, preaching to people that don't know Jesus. But in Argentina, there's lots of cults and witchcraft and all of that. People know demons. It's pretty much in all the cultures people know that these spirits exist. It, it just seems to be in the enlightened West. We just lost some of the basic knowledge. Have you ever seen a ministry that is doing that? Ever been in a ministry like that? Well, I would say that Carlos Anaconda's ministry looks a whole lot more like the ministry of Jesus Christ himself than most of the things that we've seen. Yeah, well, I give you a few Bible verses. And then you can argue with the Bible. If <laughs> So Mark chapter 1. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Did, did you pick that? Preaching in their synagogues. That's in their places of worship of God's people. <laughs> Why would you drive out demons there? Oh, well, it's just one verse. <laughs> Uh, we get to that later. <laughs> Luke chapter 4. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people. Matthew 8. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And then Jesus himself says in Luke chapter 11, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then he gave this charge to his disciples. Matthew 10, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Drive out demons. And so on, and so on, and so on. The, then the Bible, if you want to know why this is, the Bible actually spells out the fundamental truth about all of this. And in 1 John chapter 3, Jesus summarizes the purpose of his whole ministry. And he says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So from the beginning, that's the main enemy, the main thing. And then the, the final victory actually happened here on the cross. I give you just one Bible verse, Colossians 2. Having disarmed the powers and authorities of Satan, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So why is the cross of Jesus Christ the triumph over Satan? Because our first human ancestors, Adam and Eve, they sinned. And we've been sinning ever since. And when you sin, you end up belonging to Satan. When you sin, there is a separation coming into your life between you and God because God is holy and sin cannot be in his presence. So if you sin, if you rebel, if whatever it is, it separates you from God and you come under the influence and domain of Satan. That's why we die. And the triumph that was won is... Because Jesus died for us, because Jesus actually gave us the means, the sacrifice of removing the sin that we've committed, the penalty of that sin. Because now forgiveness is available to us through Christ and his blood shed on the cross, we can be forgiven, completely clean again. All the sin, all the effects of sins are wiped away, which basically means the devil has lost his hold, his foothold on us. He's lost. And we're with Jesus. So, you know, that's, that's the fundamental uh, basis behind it. And then when in the Bible, even Jesus himself talks about conversion, he's very blunt that it is a transfer from the power of Satan to the power of God. i just give you Acts chapter 26. Jesus is talking to Paul and he says to him, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. But um, two more. Ephesians 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. 
which is Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And then 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So what is it saying? Every conversion, every time someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, there's a transfer from the influence and the power of Satan to God. Yeah, that's, that's basic, but maybe not the way we used to talk. We, 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 you know, many times we talk about conversions and all these things without actually mentioning darkness and all this ugly stuff. But that may be a mistake. Um, I, I still remember when, you know, seven years ago, God led us into doing the outreach tent, the Jesus tent. And, you know, in the beginning we called it the Jesus tent of the supernatural. So and the idea was we put it in Queen's Park and start in evangelizing people, invite them, preach Jesus to them and let God confirm the message with healings and miracles and all of that. Um, we had a very clear mandate from God to do it. And when we finally did it and had five nights in Queen's Park, every night something happened that I didn't see coming and I didn't expect. I don't think anyone expected. Every single night in Queen's Park, in Toowoomba, demons would manifest in people in the tent. Every night. Like, and I had no experience with that. Like, what do you do with them? Um, well, you know, a few more people had experience. Um, I still remember Saturday night, you know, the second last night, there was this woman and she was right up front in full view of everyone and she was screaming and contorting, you know, eyes rolled back and like the demons would talk through her mouth and the demons would say, we are many and you know, like I thought, where am I? <laughs> this is our tent in Toowoomba where it's just like, this is like on TV. And I thought, wow. And, and then the, the following night, um, the highlight, you know, the final night, already noticed during the worship the atmosphere wasn't as easy. It was just, seemed to be a little bit heavy. And it turned out there was a reason why it was a bit heavy. Because the final night, we had these warlocks or Satanists or, you know, from the other side, they were standing on the ridge behind the tent and they were fire twirling and cursing the tent while we were preaching Jesus inside the tent. I thought, wow, i got to read the Bible again. It just sounds a bit like the book of Acts. A power encounter in a city. Like... I didn't see that coming, but ever since we did tents, we had a separate tent for those that were struggling with demons. And when Carlos Anaconda does it, you know, he's, he knows when he challenges them, they do manifest. The ministry teams, did you see how many ministry teams that were walking around? They all knew what they were doing, you know, vest. They take them to a tent that is 70 meter long and 18 meters wide. So that's a massive tent. And the tent would be in operation every night from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. So we had a small separate tent. But pretty much every time we had a tent, we had people in there and they got free of the demonic. And I didn't see that coming. I, I still remember when you know this was all brand new. I, I never seemed to encounter a demon in my life. And, and then we did some outreach ministry some years back. I think, was it every Wednesday night, we were just offering a meal and, and probably a message about Jesus. And, you know, people from the street, everyone would come. And there was this woman that just gave her heart to Jesus. And I felt to ask whether she, whether she has a demon or whether she has any experience with demons. And I felt super awkward. I said, you can't ask that question. Like, what will she think of me? I mean, that's offensive to ask that kind of question. Like, I've never asked anyone a question, you know, do you have a demon? Like, this is not the question you ask. It's not polite. So, but like, so I'm so super nervous. And so I ask her, I don't know how I put it, but super careful. And he says, yeah, yeah, I, I got two. <laughs> one is on my back here and one is inside. And, and, and then she was a bit distraught and broken because she couldn't get rid of them. I thought, well, I didn't, I didn't expect that answer. I'm glad I asked. But, you know, she was involved in witchcraft. Like, you know, it wasn't unfamiliar to her. So we got rid of them. It's actually not that difficult to get rid of them. In Jesus' name, go. 
you, you just repent of your sin. Jesus forgives you. Satan loses a foothold. You tell them to go, they go. And uh, this woman, I remember, she also got healed of breast cancer. She had tumors in her breast. The next CT scan she went to, they had all disappeared. <laughs> and she asked me, is this normal? <laughs> yeah, from a medical point of view, it's not normal, but Jesus can do anything. So I guess from our little experience, we know that um, it's not unusual when you actually preach Jesus to those that are lost and under the power of you know, darkness, that some of those things you encounter, there are demons, there are unclean spirits, and they're not that rare. They may not be under every bush, but they're not that rare either. And it's a normal occurrence if you do evangelism that you encounter them and don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm going to... Last year, was it last year, we, we started the young adult school. And the young adults, you know, the goal was that our young adults, you know, from maybe from 19 to 29 or whatever, we would teach Jesus and also make them experience something of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I was thinking, get them into t speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues, whatever. What I didn't see coming is that among the young adults, and there were not a huge number, demons would manifest in our living room. It, it, no one expected that. And so the other young adults, they're a little bit, oh. And, and I say, it's only a little one. <laughs> and, and, and I would actually show them what to do. And then we got rid of it. But this is Toowoomba. Um, may, maybe I just clarify. You know, with the demonic, all of us encountered, even Jesus himself did, because the Bible says he was tempted by Satan himself. So, which basically means some of the desires of you wanting to do things, you're being tempted, stirred up, to wanting to do things. You know, even things that go through your head and that becomes, you know, attractive to you can be put to you by the power of darkness. You know, it certainly was the case with Jesus. But, you know, that's from the outside and sometimes, you know, you can feel satanic oppression. You can feel it when, you know, the peace gets a bit disturbed around you and you don't sleep properly and you just know, you know, you've got to pray and, you know, you, there's a fight on your hands. Um, but then, you know, not only on the outside, some, sometimes we can sin and something actually lodges inside or with us or however you want to put it. And then it's there on a more permanent basis and it's causing trouble. And the, the Bible actually gives a few names of those spirits and they are, sometimes the names of the spirit show what they do. You know, the effect they have on you. Like, you know, the spirit of sickness. That's in Luke chapter 13. So what does the spirit of sickness do? Well, it makes you sick. Spirit of impurity... Spirit of prostitution, you could say spirit of lust, deceiving spirit, spirit of fear. That's all in the Bible. And, and then, you know, you can have encounter those with pride, spirit of jealousy, self-pity, and all of that. Okay, back to Carlos Anacondia. So, we may be okay with that if we do evangelism and bring people you know, to the knowledge of Jesus, and they come out of darkness into the kingdom of light, maybe we encounter some demonic activity then. But the guy that is actually in charge of Carlos Anaconda's tent, his name is Pablo Butari. And he says, you know, over the, his course of ministry, he's probably helped one million people in the tent and probably personally involved in helping people in, with deliverance of 30,000. So, so once you have 30,000 people under your belt, you know a little bit what you're talking about. And he says that of those that are getting free of demons are probably 90 to 95% of Christians. How do you handle that information? 90 to 95% of Christians. 
So even if you want to quibble about percentages and say, 90, no, that sounds too high, and you go down to 80, that's still too many. 80%, 90%. Is that possible? And what he says, Pablo Butari, and this is really the point of my message today, he says, when someone becomes a Christian, usually they're on cloud nine. You know, they're discovering Jesus, they're full of peace, they're full of joy, they're flying, everything is going well. And then they hit some snares. There's struggle, there's opposition, there's fights, and they don't seem to make progress. And instead of, you know, soaring in their Christian faith, they're hobbled and in bondage, and they don't have freedom, and they don't have joy in their Christian faith. And why is that the case? According to Pablo Butari, he says, because when they become Christians, they're not properly cleaned up. They're not properly set free of all the things that hold them in bondage. Is that correct? It, it makes sense, doesn't it? Like the only time we actually deal with anything demonic is when it stirs in our faith. Uh, uh, faith, you know, just when, when it occurs. In a worship service, we have that here as well. Like, and we're not even getting troubled anymore. It's just we, we all go, oh yeah, another one. But we're not targeting, you know, a, a new Christian intentionally and just going through the life and just making sure that really everything is removed. We just maybe say a simple sinner's prayer and leave it at that. Um, maybe I just share a little bit, you know, my own journey, own experience, because I I think that Pablo Butaro is right. We're not doing it properly, in people that way. I mean, can you imagine if you let's say, let's say you have a spirit of lust, and usually when you have a spirit like that, you don't actually know that it's there because they love to be in hiding, right? Because if, if they're in hiding, if you don't know that they're there, you don't deal with it. You actually think it's you yourself. But if, you, if you're struggling, let's say, with lust or pornography or whatever, and you know there's all the shame and sin and guilt and hiddenness, whatever, it's all there, and you think you're just struggling with your own sinful flesh or nature, whatever... That's one thing, but you know, if, if it's demonically charged and uh, uh, there's an unclean spirit that is actually using his power to keep you in bondage, like it's so much harder to get free. It would be so much easier to get rid of that spirit and, and then enjoy the freedom that comes in Jesus. So it's a learning curve. I, I remember a few years ago, um, it was a social gathering. We had invited a family. Um, for dinner at our place, they had children the same age as our children, so primary school age and whatever, and the family comes in, the wife walks past me, and I just think about food, and suddenly this thought comes into my head, this woman has a demon. So like, suddenly I just knew this woman had a demon, so I had a word of knowledge, that was the first one that I had, like, that was a bit surprising. You know, where did that come from? I didn't think of anything spiritual. And then I thought, oh, this woman has a demon. What do you do with that? Like, uh, it's, a, it's a dinner engagement. You can't say, hello. <laughs> I think you may have a demon. Like, uh, oh, she wouldn't have taken that well. Like, she was a very proper and clean and everything. And, you know, it was the wrong kind of suggestion. And I didn't know what to do with it, so I left it. So this woman, though, came into renewal. And she came into a season where she grew closer to Jesus and, and really made a, a start with Jesus. And then Jesus was dealing with stuff in her life. And in her particular life, it was control. Super control. And so, you know, the, the thing before her was, was she able to relinquish control to Jesus and trust him? So that was a huge fight. And Jesus seemed to be winning. And when Jesus seemed to be winning, suddenly her worship experience changed. Every time she came to church, any time the name Jesus was mentioned, she would fly into rage. She could not handle 
the mentioning of Jesus' name, either in preaching or worship or anything. And she felt this urge, to, you know, this angry and, and running out of the church. And she, she's the one that needs to have everything in control. She couldn't handle making a scene and all of that. And, but she knew it was a demon. And then that demon actually worked physical darkness over her vision. You know, it would, darkness would cover her vision. When she was driving the car, the demon is in her ear, driving her to suicide. You know, drive against that tree, kill yourself, and all of that. And so, well, the symptoms are pretty clear. Discernment was not so difficult. And then she made the choice, maybe I stay away from church, and then maybe the demon leaves me at peace. It's like, and, and she did, like, um, I wish it was a happy end. It's not smart, is it? It, it may be not the attractive, most attractive revelation you ever have in your life, that there's an unclean spirit in you, but if you know there is one, you know you need to go to Jesus and be free of it. Because that thing inside you, Satan hates you. And whatever he may promise, he breaks them all. So, yeah, that was one. That was a huge wake-up call for me. That was one of the first encounters. And then probably, was it two years later or something like that, our oldest daughter brings a boyfriend to our Holy Spirit conference here in Toowoomba. And... That young boyfriend, how old was he at the time? Stefan, 19 or something? 20? Anyway, young. On fire for Jesus. You know, like, oh, Holy Spirit seminar, all of that was a little bit new, but he was so hungry, so hungry. So he's there worshipping, worshipping. He gets prayed for in the Holy Spirit seminar. He hits the carpet and is filled with the Spirit and all of that. And then they drive home and on the Sunday night. They drive home to Brisbane. Um, our oldest daughter, she, she stays with him you know, in, in his parents' home. They're talking, debriefing. Then he shares something that happened in his childhood. Um, it was sexual abuse and it was trauma. And he never shared it with anyone. And as he, sh as he shared that trauma and what happened to him, suddenly he would manifest an unclean spirit. And it manifested in him that there was a shudder going through his right side. I don't know. It was just like uncontrollable, is it twitching or cramping, whatever. It was uncomfortable, certainly, because it didn't stop for a long time. And then my, my daughter, you know, wasn't experienced, had no experience with that either, but she would look into his eyes and he was not looking out, out of his eyes. It was actually the unclean spirit looking at her. <laughs> she didn't know what to do. She prayed in tongues. You know, the spirit couldn't get to her. She seemed to be safe. But then the boyfriend would come back and say, oh, I'm so sorry, what's happening here? And then it would be the unclean spirit again. Like, and so that was going on for a while. Um, didn't know what to do. It was certainly a, a new experience for her. Then finally, because there was no progress, she thought... I'm going to knock at his parents' bedroom door and wake them up and get some help. And she said that was scarier than the unclean spirit. <laughs> but the dad told me, so it's probably 2 a.m. in the morning or something like that, so it's my daughter knocking at the bedroom door, the, the husband, you know, it's awoken from sleep, opens the door and he says to me, one look! at your daughter's face, and I was wide awake. I knew something was seriously wrong. So mum and dad come, check out their son. Their son is manifesting a demon. Now, the husband, the, the wife was a bit more into it, fully on Christian, but, but the husband just went to church because I guess his wife went to church, and church was okay, but nothing too spiritual, please. You know, let's just, no, no, not, to be, not too involved. But suddenly his son in his own home, is, he's having a very spiritual experience. It's just, it's just the other side. So, well, the diagnosis is very clear. So the mum, mum is very mum-like, like, my son, my son, like, she's a bit panicky, whatever. So she turns to him and says, you are the head of this house, the spiritual head of this household. Do something! <laughs> so, so, 
I, 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 well, yeah. So I apologize for the language. So I'm just quoting him, all right? So just handle it. So he looks at that demon like in his son and he says, Piss off! <laughs> in Jesus' name. Yeah, 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 mate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not too bad, hey. <laughs> so, he meant it, but it didn't work at that time. Um, two, two days later, they come up here, and we had a whole team, and we dealt with some of the stuff that was in the past, and everything was just properly forgiven and blessed and prayed over, and then he got free, and he's free today. But can you imagine how, if that's inside of you and that trauma is there and it's demonically charged, how that's holding you back in your Christian life? And, you know, this is, this is our family. You know, he, he, he was going in and out of our home and he was on fire Christian. Um, then after that, I, I did a seminar for church leaders in New South Wales church leaders, which basically passes and chair people of, of, of the churches. And so I, I was basically telling things that happened here at Living Grace. And then during the break, the chairman of one congregation comes with his pastor. And what happened when, when, when I was sharing what happened here, like with the Jesus tent and whatever, he felt that blasphemy was rising up within him. Blasphemy. Like I'm not giving you the language, but he recognized that that wasn't him. That was something from outside, was just reacting against what I was sharing. Then he, he caught up with his pastor, and the pastor brought him to me. And it turns out, he's a chairman of a congregation, chairman of a church. He had made a pact with the devil. Like, it's, it's not the first time that I encountered it. Christians, like a pact with the devil, and, the, and it's, it's an old one. Because when he was growing up, his parents didn't get on and they were always fighting and they were screaming at home. And he was so traumatized by all the, the fighting that he had a deal. He talked to the devil and said, Look, if you take away the memory of all that fighting, my soul belongs to you. Right. And the devil kept his side of the bargain because the memory left. And he actually, ever since he had problems with his memory, wouldn't it help to clean up this properly when he becomes a Christian? Like, it would probably just needed the question, uh, by the way, have you ever made a pact with the devil? <laughs> yes, okay, it's something we've got to deal with. But no one ever asked him. And actually, he was here this year with his wife, and he was going well. But the thing, he left, then the pastor talked to me and said, I got the same problem. <laughs> he, didn't, he had met, made a pact with the devil, but every time he presided over Holy Communion, blasphemy would rise within him. So whenever, you know, the Holy bl blood, body and blood of Jesus is dealing with it, blasphemy would... Because it's holy, and the unclean spirits don't like the, the increase of holiness. They react... So that's how you can tell. Um, I'm almost finished, but like pastors, when we were in Vietnam, there was a pastor that had already started two churches, and they were going well, and he was evangelizing on the bus and bringing peop people to Jesus. So we come, teach on the Holy Spirit, we lay hands on people, he gets a good dose of the Holy Spirit's power, he ends up on the floor, but he gets up twitching a little bit funnily. And all the other pastors say, oh, you know, I th think he's got a demon. And I look at him and I'm not quite sure. Usually time will tell. Um, yeah, it, it was an unclean spirit. And there was a woman that, you know, she used to do it and she prayed to get rid of it. And he couldn't get free. And the next day he was still twitching around and not free of that unclean spirit. And then Vic, Vicky was part of the team uh, in Vietnam the Holy Spirit tells her the sin that this pastor is not confessing. 
So through the translator, she talks to him and says, look, this is the sin you're not confessing. He listens to it and says, mm, that's right. So he confesses that sin. He's a little bit happy that Jesus cares so much about that, that he just uses someone just to bring it in the open. And then he got free. But that's a pastor. And, and then uh, this is the last one. We were in New Zealand, this is maybe two years ago. We got invited by this pastor to do a Holy Spirit revival, you know, get everyone filled with the Holy Spirit, have a great time in God. And, and we did. And I prayed for the pastor as well. He ended up on the floor. And then he started manifesting a demon. And that demon is actually talking to me. Like, I'm still a little bit surprised by that, <laughs> right? This is the spiritual leader of the community. And suddenly, you know, what did he say? one of the things is, who is the Holy Spirit? <laughs> like, what? So what's my point? I, I, I remember there was conflict. I, I wasn't on the sideline. I wasn't involved in that conflict. But I, I saw another pastor get in trouble because his bishop said to his church, that if you're a Christian, a baptized Christian, you cannot have a demon. Yeah, where is that in the Bible? And like all the, all, all the testimonies that I've just mentioned, they were Christians. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not debating that they were properly Christians, but they, they had a demon. And I would say the logic is even flawed. If you can be a baptized Christian and still sin, you can still be vulnerable to the demonic. So, it, it basically means that when people come to Jesus, and they will come to Jesus more frequently in this church, it's time to reach out, it's time to build, it's time to bring Jesus, uh, people to Jesus. But we got to know that once they come into the kingdom of God, they got to be cleaned up properly. Because they've lived all their lives in the kingdom of darkness. They lived all their lives being open to anything. Seances, Ouija board, witchcraft books, playing around, doing all sorts of things, other religions, praying to this, praying to that. They've been properly in the kingdom of darkness. And once Jesus opens their minds and brings them into his kingdom, they've got to be cleaned up. How do you do that? You, you may be surprised that even the church in the West, the ancient baptism rites, still know about it. This, this is how, I'm not sure how, how many pastors still use it, but it's still in our books. Uh, i give you a quote. Baptism liturgy. This is the rite of doing the baptism. The pastor says, Until Christ claims us in baptism through his Holy Spirit, we are under the power of the devil. Therefore I say, depart from this person, you unclean spirit, and make way for the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is, is that a little bit full on? So that they seem to, that's, that's usually what needs to happen at a baptism. And then actually the person to be baptized gets asked, do you renounce the devil and all of his works and all of his ways? So the knowledge is there. But um, to do a, a proper process, you could use a book like this. It's called The Steps to Freedom in Christ. So I'm actually recommending it to you if you want to do it at home with someone that actually has checklists, it has prayers, it's super practical, it's about seven major issues in life, including, you know... Um, Oh, un un unforgiveness, bondage, curses, um, all of that, priorities. Um, it's easy to follow, it's not much to read, and it, it's not difficult at all. You've just got to be a little bit intentional in the approach. And what I want to do this morning, if you want, we do the first step together. So, are you up for it? Yep. So, okay. So, the first prayer that we're going to pray, I'll lead you in that prayer. We are praying. We are asking God to bring to mind anything that is maybe there that's troubling, and um, point things out. This is here about 
cults, false, false religion, occult, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, maybe just focus on Jesus and, re and repeat, repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, please bring to my mind anything and everything that I've done knowingly or unknowingly that involves occult, cult, false religious teachings or practices. I want to experience your freedom by renouncing any and all false guidance. In Jesus' name I pray. And then, can we have the first slide? <coughs> Go through it. It's a checklist. You know, that, that helps. And it's by no means complete. I, I've, I've seen checklists, you know, it goes on for pages of different stuff that is out there, but it gives you, I think it gives you a fairly good impression. You know, ever been involved in any of that? And I'm not saying that, you know, it's automatically that you have an unclean spirit with that. But you can renounce all of it, just to be sure. Ever been involved in any of that? Um, and then go to the next slide. It's all cults. And there are spirits involved in that. And especially people that are properly in those religions, they know they're connecting with spiritual power. It's just not Jesus. And, and they do repent, and they do renounce, and they get, they get free. And maybe other religions, go to the last one. So we're doing it very quickly. If you need more time, you can do it after this service. Yeah. So all of that. So Holy Spirit may have brought something else, but we got all of this here. There are some additional questions in the book. Where, where the question is, do you now have, or ha have you ever had an imaginary friend, a spirit guide or angel offering you guidance or companionship? You know, that, that's not as rare as you may think either. Uh, have you ever heard voices in your head or had repeating, nagging thoughts? And, and I think Riley shared in his testimony before, you know, voices in your head. Um, sometimes that's not just your own thoughts. Have you ever been hypnotized, attended a New Age seminar, or consulted a medium or spiritist? Have you ever made a secret vow or pact or an inner vow? Ever been involved in a witchcraft ritual or attended a concert or event in which Satan was the focus? You know, none of that is innocent. All of that makes us vulnerable to catching something that we don't want. Okay, I, I lead you now in a prayer of renouncing. Are you ready? So, Lord Jesus, I confess that I have participated in, and now you just fill in what's come to you. Just include everything. I continue. I renounce them all as counterfeits. I pray that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may be guided by you. Thank you that in Christ I am forgiven. Amen. And now in the name of Jesus Christ and by the authority he has given his church, I just add to it that in Jesus' name I take authority of all the sin and the power of sin that's been in your life and I break it in Jesus' name. And I declare to you that Jesus washes you clean of all sin. You're holy, you're righteous, the holy blood of Jesus washes away all unrighteousness and all the footholds of the enemy. 
And why not as a church we just take on this catch cry, listen to me, Satan, this is the church of Jesus Christ, this is Living Grace Church, called into existence by the will of God, and we come against you in the name of Jesus. Listen to me, Satan, you have no place in this, in this house. You have no place among the people in this house. I command you to go and I break all the curses, all the witchcraft, all the oppression of the enemy in Jesus' name. You need to leave now. Be birth people properly into the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 So before I hand over to Dirk, so if you're sitting here this morning and you feel like there's still something stirring or you know something was brought up that maybe you need someone to talk with to properly deal with it, there's a prayer team available at the end of the service. Just approach any one of them. You don't have to go home still being oppressed. You can be free in Jesus' name. Amen.